lives, your best in their hearts and in their lives. And we just give you glory. We give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you want to, go ahead, turn in 1 Kings chapter 8. And uh, we're going to read from there here in a moment. Uh, we are doing a series titled The Honorable Names of God. And uh, The Honorable Names of God. Now, over the next few Sundays and weeks, again, we will be looking more in depth at some of the names of God. I want us to explore some added value. Everybody say added value to his many names and give the Holy Spirit opportunity to reveal greater understanding through the scriptures of the beauty and deeper layers of who God is and who he can be in our lives. I want to recognize God more than just the surface level. I want to go deeper, right? I think there's a place and a point in our lives sometimes, even as Christians, where we just, I don't want to use the word content out of context, but we're satisfied. We're like, you know what? God has been so good to me, and I'm thankful for that, but I, th I, think, I, I think I've reached the, the point of, of his goodness, and I, I don't know that there's really much more that, that I can even obtain or receive. I want to encourage you that just when you think that you know everything or that you've gotten everything, there is more that God wants for his people. He wants us to go deeper. He wants us to study. He wants us to go in to, uh, I think about the scripture and the story talks, talking about getting into the river. You know, you can either go ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, or you can go in completely and allow the Lord just to take over and to fully empower you. And so spiritually speaking, I want to be there. I want to continually, even into my late 70s, late 80s, and 90s, I still want to be pursuing God. I'm so thankful that there are those within this room that I just described that are still pursuing the deeper things of God. They haven't given up. They haven't said, you know what, I, that's all there is to get, and and I'm satisfied, we need to continually be thirsting after righteousness. Not our self-righteousness, but his righteousness in all that he has for us. Amen. So um, one of the things I shared last week, again, as a foundational statement, and this is what we're going to read in Kings uh, chapter 8. But there is only one true God. When we're talking about the many names of God, I want us to centralize something as a, as a doctrine and as an understanding that there is one true God. As Christians, we believe in the God of Israel. We believe the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You understand that we believe that Jesus Christ, our Savior, was from the lineage of Abraham according to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. That is our history. That is our background. That is the origin. That is the God in whom we trust, in whom we serve. Now, to emphasize this, one of the famous kings of Israel was King Solomon. And I want to read this because at the point of making the dedication of the temple, he makes pro proclamation. And I want to read this to us this morning. And I want you to even let it be etched upon your own heart as recognizing who is the God that we consider the one true God. Okay? In verse uh, 54 of chapter 8, it says, When Solomon had finished all these prayers and supplications to the Lord, he rose from behind, before the altar of the Lord, where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. He stood and blessed the whole assembly of Israel in a loud voice, saying, Praise be to the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him and walk in obedience, uh, turn our hearts towards him to walk in obedience to him and keep the commands, decrees, and laws he gave our ancestors. 
And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to each day's need. Verse 60 is key here. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. And may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. King Solomon made a proclamation, and that verse 60 is key in what I want us to focus on when we talk about the one true God. He says, so that all the peoples of the earth were included in that. All the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. There is no other. There is no other one true God. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob became Israel. You realize our history, our existence is because God's chosen people, Israel, existed. I'm going to bring it closer to home. Real life fellowship would not be here if it wasn't for Israel. The United States of America would not be here if it was not for the nation of Israel. You say, how? put this together for me, Pastor. What were we founded upon? We were found, our forefathers founded this nation on the Judeo-Christian truths and values. In God we trust. What God are we referring to? The God of Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, as Christian believers, those that proclaim Jesus as our Savior, what was his lineage? It was through Abraham. It's traced back all the various generations in the book of Matthew. If it wasn't for Israel, we would not be here. God is purposeful in the way that he is organizing and orchestrating history. So when we say we need to stand with Israel, we need to pray for Israel, we need to be on the side of God's people, it is for a reason, it is for a value. If we fail to understand some of our history and our heritage, we are diluting the very purpose and the holiness and the value of who our God is. We don't serve a Hindu God. We don't serve a Muslim God. We are set apart and there is one true God. Okay? Have, I, have, have we nailed it down? Is the foundation strong? All right? There we go. I'm glad you feel better, Howard. <laughs> when we think about who God is and who his people are and that we have been blessed to be adopted into his beloved family, it gives us a greater measure of appreciation and value in our kingdom heritage. Last week when we talked about name and how important is a name, we also talked about heritage. You realize that we have been grafted in. We've been adopted into his family, not of our own accord, not of our own wishful doing and making it happen. No, it was an invitation. And he says, come on in. I want us to take a moment and pray a prayer of thanksgiving. And I'm not going to lead it out. I just want you to reflect and think about that. We're here in this church again, bringing it home. We're in the United States. Why? Because God loved Israel, and God continues to love Israel. And God has blessed these United States of America. Let's be thankful. Let's be prayerful. So let's just take a moment. We're going to do a little exercise and just have a moment of quiet and silence, whatever the Lord moves upon your heart.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving your people. Again, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Your mercies, they are new every morning. Thank you, God. We thank you for your mercy today. Thank you for accepting us into the fold. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of the family. Jesus, it's by your blood. By your blood. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I think it's just so good sometimes to reflect and think about. I know it's basic. It's Christianity 101, but sometimes we have to get back to the foundation of who we are. Who are we? We are in him. Who is he? He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel, and he is the Lord of the world. Amen. Last Sunday, we laid the foundation on how we view God and we use his name with honor and with respect because it, is, because it is one thing to know God's many names and his many attributes. It is another thing to live according to who he is and out of respect for who he is relative to who we are. We looked at Matthew 6, 5 through 19, the Lord's Prayer, and we emphasized about our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be your name. To treat God's name with reverence, that it is set apart, that it is holy. Amen? To consecrate his name. God's name is a reflection of who he is. So when we pray this, again, Jesus is not saying that God needs to become holy, but we are praying in such a manner recognizing that he is holy. We recognize that. Do we recognize that? We need to. Does the world recognize that? No, they don't. How are they going to know? Unless we example it in front of them, unless we show them how we honor and respect God's name in our actions, in the way that we live, in our words, in our prayers, all of it. When we pray, we are to give God the proper honor due his name. Now, in doing so, also, we never want to treat God as though he owes us anything. He has already given us so much more than we could ever hope for. He is, the, in truth, a giver. How many of y'all believe that God is a giving God? Amen. We read about it just a moment ago from Solomon. He said that he is a God who makes promises. But not only does he make promises, he keeps his promises. As his people, we must remain subject to his lordship and to his sovereignty, always trusting, always believing, always giving thanks. Now, I emphasized last week what we aren't to do. We are not to complain and to murmur, right? We saw what happened to the children of Israel whenever they did that. It was not good. <laughs> it caused delay. It caused more lessons to have to be learned. And we can be pretty hard-headed sometimes, too. And if we don't get control of this and we find ourselves complaining or blaming or murmuring, guess what? God is probably going to take us through another cycle of learning because he wants us to fully understand we need to always be thanking him, always be trusting, always be believing in who he is. Honoring his name is best determined by how. We see and approach God, both in the way we pray to him as well as how we live our daily lives with him. So just real quick, for the remaining time this morning, I want us to look back at the beginning. This is, I know this is simple, but it's very important. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Everybody can find that, I hope. Genesis 1. The very opening phrase of God's word, Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
right? That is, that is, if not the first known scripture that we memorize, it's definitely among the top five, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that word that describes who God is in the Hebrew is Elohim, Elohim. Now, when we say Elohim, we aren't just talking about many gods, even though at that time that word was also used to describe many gods, even false gods, lower gods. But when we say Elohim and whenever the, the writers are writing God's word and talking about Elohim, they're talking about the supreme God, the true God, the God that's on top. There is no other higher God than the God that created the heavens and the earth. There is no higher authority than the God who created the heavens and the earth. Now, among ancient Israel's neighbors, so those that were encamped around about Israel, again, they referred to the most powerful God as El, capital E, lowercase L, which is not actually a name, but an ancient Semitic title of God, under quote. It could refer to many gods, as I mentioned earlier, but the chief deity of all the other gods was simply titled, capital E, lowercase l, meaning the god. It's a distinctive. It's not just many or one of many. It is the god. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word, Hebrew word for God is most often Elohim, which I mentioned earlier which is used over 2,000 times to refer to the God of Israel and a few dozen times in reference to other gods. You can see by the shape of the word Elohim with E, capital E, lowercase L, it is a longer form of that word El. The Israelites also use the short term or the short form of El. So that's something just a little bit of understanding when we say Elohim, that when we're referencing Elohim and whenever the Jewish people were in Israel were referencing Elohim, they were referencing the mighty God, the supreme God, the top God. Now, culturally, they would take that word El and they would apply it to many gods. Understand? Now, there are other variations of El like Eloah, an Aramaic variation, or El Elyon, which means God Most High. Uh, as it's recorded in Genesis 14, 18. Now, here's another L that maybe you are more common or familiar with, El Shaddai. How many of y'all have heard El Shaddai, right? El Shaddai means God of power or almighty God, as it's depicted in Genesis 17, 1. So, again, when we talk about the names of God, even from the very beginning, when we recognize God as creator, that he is Elohim, and he is the supreme God. He's not just a God amongst others, but he is the God. Amen? So, now, unfortunately, man has messed up on many occasions and has tried to, in his own strength, duplicate God or replace God or even deny God. God and who he is. How many of y'all would agree with that, right? We, mankind has messed up in those different areas. I want us to look at two quick passages of scripture I want to read through. First, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 1 in the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, and we see Paul as he's writing the Romans And we're going to look at verse 18, okay? And this is a caution. And this isn't, a, isn't just a caution to the Romans, but this is a caution to us even today. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, but because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, 
being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. How many of y'all can say that people are without excuse, right? Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being in birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires, in the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. We'll just stop right there for a second. Again, it goes back. Mankind has messed it up so many times where we have either replaced or tried to duplicate or denied who God is. And Paul is making it very clear that God even gave them over to their own wickedness. And we see so many times, even in our own culture, in our own society, where man is making the same mistake today. And we are getting so smart, we're stupid. Right? It says that we are so wise in our own eyes that we become foolish. We have to be careful. We have to go back to the reality and understanding of who God is as our creator and that we don't worship anything other than who he is. We worship him. We don't worship his creation. We don't worship the trees and the, and the birds and, and any man-made object the goal there and the factor there is again what it's man-made we worship him and him alone (coughs) the final passage that i want us to look at in talking about creation and who god is is psalm 51 some of y'all are familiar with this but it is a reflection that i want us to leave with today in our own hearts and It's taking a true assessment of saying, God, I realize as mankind I fall short. And I need you to create a pure heart in me. So let's read it together. Psalm 51, again from the Psalm of David, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Doesn't that sound familiar already this morning? The steadfast love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let, my, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Verse 10 here is key. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Man, if you ever find yourself in a wallowing pit of sin or despair or where you have royally messed it up, be quick to repent. Be quick to seek after the Lord. And if so, do 
open up your Bible, read Psalm 51 and come alongside with what David wrote and say, God, I, I need you to create in me a pure heart, a pure spirit. Against you and you alone have I sinned. We need God. We need that constant recognition of his steadfast love and his mercy. Especially in this fallen world, again, when we think upon and study the honorable names of God, I want us to concentrate and remember that we serve the one true God. He is supreme. There is no other. And when we pray to him, when we live our lives, let us let us do it with honor and reverence for who he is and devotion to him. And then just concluding this morning in a similar fashion as the psalmist wrote. Pray that God creates in us a pure heart. I think Paul said, I die daily. I don't measure up. It is only by the grace of God that I'm able to even come into your presence, that your presence would be with me. Amen. Why don't we stand? Let's stand. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Lord, we just, again, express thankfulness for your mercy in your steadfast love. I know that that will be echoed in our hearts and in our minds throughout the rest of today and in the days ahead. Lord, as we reestablish this morning that we serve one true God, that we understand our origin and, and our heritage, that, Lord, that the words we speak would be that of blessing and of thanksgiving and of hope, because that's what you speak of us, oh God. You give us a hope, you give us a future. So Lord, I pray that each and every one of us, again, as we declare that you are our God, our hope is in you. I'm so thankful for the heritage that we have in you. How powerful you are, God. With one spoken word, you're able to create. Hmm. I was thinking back uh, to yesterday. Nicole and I, we were out, and maybe y'all have started in the process too, some of y'all doing gardening, and how much work it takes to, to get things ready to create something. And it shows how limited we are. And yet God, with one word, he can speak and something is created. Something comes into existence because he speaks. Lord, we thank you for your word. The word of truth. The word of hope. The word that gives life everlasting. Lord, I pray that it just resonates in our hearts throughout the rest of today and in the days ahead. Where we are in a society and a world that's all accepting of all other kinds of gods. And even when we say God out in the public, it could be misinterpreted as to who it is that we're referring to. Lord, I pray that we would live lives in such a way. And we would not be shy, but we would be bold to proclaim who is the God we serve. We serve the one true God. And Lord, you sent your son to die on that cross that none should perish, but that all would have everlasting life. Use us, God. Use us to declare your works, your mighty deeds. And just as the psalmist wrote, help us be obedient to your decrees, to your commandments, to your direction. Create in us 
a pure heart, a clean heart. Amen. Think about why that's so important for a second. Why is it so important that we have a pure and clean heart? Because he desires to flow through us. We are to be vessels of honor used by him. And he desires to use a holy vessel, a vessel that's been set apart for his purposes. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. If you want prayer, we'll be up here.